Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome. My name is Jeremy Leffler, and I work in the Policy Office at the National Science Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today to the Fall 2021 NSF Virtual Grants Conference. I'm now pleased to present the NSF Introduction and Overview. This session will be presented by Caitlin Fife, Director of the Budget Division, and Erwin Giancondani, who is a Senior Advisor in the NSF Office of the Director. Hello everyone, it's so nice to be back um, speaking with you today. My name is Caitlin Fife, and I'm gonna be going over um, a couple topics, uh, including the budget um, for NSF. Next slide. So today we're gonna talk through um, the origins of NSF, the organization. We're gonna provide some budget and other context. We'll talk about the 2022 budget that was just released, funding trends, and I'll also provide you some links to some key documents. Uh, you will be able to ask questions, um, but as we're going, feel free to put them in the chat. Next slide. Inspired by advances in science and technology that occurred as a result of World War II, the NSF was established by Congress in the National Foundations Act of 1950. NSF was created in 1950, nearly seven decades ago, with the mission to promote the progress of science, advance the national health, prosperity, and welfare, and to secure the national defense. NSF accomplished this, accomplishes this mission through its role to encourage and develop a national policy for the promotion of basic research and education in math, physical, medical, biological, engineering, and other sciences. We initiate and support basic scientific research and we evaluate the science research programs undertaken by agencies of the federal government. The picture in front of you is NSF's headquarters building in Alexandria, Virginia, and we're hoping that we all get to go back and that you'll be able to visit soon. Next slide. NSF is an independent agency. This means that NSF is outside of the cabinet agencies. NSF supports fundamental basic research and education in all of the non-medical fields of science and engineering. We have a very low overhead, about 94% of NSF's funds go out the doors to awardees, which is enabled by automated systems such as NSF Fastlane, research.gov, and our uh, expanded virtual panel capacities. We have a discipline-based um, structure, kind of like colleges and universities. And it's important, an important aspect of NSF's is our use of rotators, in particular IPAs. NSF has a special hiring authority to bring people in from the community on a temporary basis. This keeps NSF connected to the communities that we serve and ensures that we have new, fresh voices coming into the foundation. For gov our governance um, is the National Science Board. These are members are appointed by the president and it includes um, 24 members, including the director. Um, and it's a very important aspect of NSF being an independent agency. Next slide. Vannevar Bush is the spiritual father of NSF and a federal funding for basic science. In his 1945 report, Science, the Endless Frontier, spurred the creation of a system of public support for university research that endures to this day. There is a statue of him at NSF in the office of the director, and it's a 3D print of his statue is in the archives at the Smithsonian. I'd now like to provide an overview for how NSF is organized. As you see at the top, we have the director and the deputy director, and to, um, to the left, the National Science Board that I just reviewed previously. You will also notice that down along the bottom, we have um, various uh, directorates that include both um, various disciplines of science, as well as the bu budget finance and awards management and information and resource management, which are the business operations side of the agency. In addition, you will notice that we have um, various other offices that are of high importance that report to the director off to the right up top. And you'll see that the Office of the Inspector General is off to the left, um, connected to the National Science Board, and then obviously um, the rest of the agency as well. 
I'm now going to provide an overview of NSF by the numbers. As the budget director and a numbers person, this helps me understand um, the impact that the agency has. You will see that in fiscal year 2021, the most recent fiscal year that's been completed, NSF had an, a budget of $8.5 billion, and of that, 94% of those funds were in research and education activities. In 2020, we supported about 2,000 institutions and about over 300,000 people. We received about 43,000 proposals each year, and we selected 12,000 for funding. This means that we declined about 30,000 proposals last year. Many of them passed over due to a lack of funds rather than failing to meet our standards. Awards are determined through a merit review process regarded throughout the world as the unequaled standard of scientific review. It relies on expertise of accomplished scientists to ensure that all NSF projects are the highest quality and have the potential to advance the frontiers of knowledge and transform our world. NSF program reviews have always been focused on intellectual merit. We must be doing something right because in the last count, NSF supported researchers have received 248 Nobel Prizes. Although NSF invested in all of those laureates basic research long before they were recognized by the Nobel Committee. Next slide. This slide shows NSF support of academic basic research. Only basic research, um, only at academic institutions, and only federal funds. NSF is a major federal funding source for academic basic research. Many government organizations work to ensure that the US leads in research and innovation. We partner with many of them on research initiatives. NSF is a major funder of universities in many critical fields, ensuring that virtual research areas continue to contribute in increasing the nation's leadership. Next slide. The most detailed document on NSF's budget is issued each year alongside the president's budget request in the form of our congressional justifications. This 400 plus page document can be found on our website and allows the public to drill into details for a given discipline or program. The link to our most recent budget documents are provided at the end of my presentation. It is worth noting that in fiscal year 2022, the budget request uh, that went up for NSF was a historic level and exceeded $10 billion for the first time in the agency's 70 year history. Next slide. Each of NSF's six appropriations counts are listed on this slide with the most recent amount. In general, we have three program accounts, which are the first three you see listed, research and related activities, education and human resources, and major research equipment and facilities construction. The remaining three accounts are those that support our um, NSF staff salaries and travel and other operational costs such as rent. Um, that's the agency operations and awards management. As you see, the Office of the Inspector General and the Office of the National Science Board each have their own budget lines as well. So what comes next for fiscal year 2022? Well, we're anxiously awaiting the full year appropriation uh, that Congress will provide for us. The fiscal year does start on October 1st, and until we receive the full year appropriation, we'll be operating under a continuing resolution. In addition to the annual appropriations, Congress is also working through several authorizing uh, pieces of legislation that may provide additional resources to NSF beyond our annual funding level. An example is highlighted here on this slide, including the NSF of the Futures Act. And if you're interested, you can check out this piece of legislation at the link here. What all of these have in common is that NSF is extremely excited to be thinking about potential growth where we can engage even more with our community and support additional research. What happens when we don't have a full year appropriation on October 1st? NSF and many other federal agencies will operate under what's called a continuing resolution. What this means is the agency is able to operate at the prior year's funding level um, until a full year appropriation is passed by Congress. 
What this chart shows is that CRs are getting longer over time. Since 1991, the, the full time period covered in this slide, the average is about 83 days. If you were to just look at the average time since 2000, that's about 106 days. And the average time that agencies have spent under a CR since 2016 is 135 days. Um, while this uh, is a, a time of uncertainty for agencies, we are able to continue our work at the same rate as the prior year. And we do our best to um, implement the plans to the fullest extent while maintaining the flexibility of Congress to make changes in the final bill. Next slide. Now that we've talked about a lot of money, um, what are your chances of getting funded? This slide shows the success rate for research grant awards, um, which was about 28% in fiscal year 2020. This has increased over the last several years. Um, however, it does vary by directorate. The numbers that we're showing here are the agency's, um, are the, is the agency average. Um, and you can see that as our budget has increased, so too, for the most part, has our uh, success rate. Next slide. The NF NSF award portfolio reflects the active awards over multiple years provided in either standard or continuing awards. Some of the numbers that I've showed you up to this point focus on just one year. However, as you know, there are grants that operate over multiple years, meaning that the amount of funding that NSF has out to grantees and that we're managing and helping to award far exceeds what we get, are given in a single year. You can see here that we have about 28 billion in total award funding that is active with 54,000 active awards and over 3,000 awardees. The blue box shows the activity that NSF is engaged in with our grantees throughout the award cycle. I'd now like to provide you some links to key resources I've referenced throughout my presentation. These are a great place to find additional detailed information in areas that you might be interested in that we weren't able to cover today. I'd now like to turn the presentation over to Erwin Gianchandani. All right, thanks very much and hello everybody. Uh, my name is Erwin Gianchandani and I serve as Senior Advisor to the Director for Translation, Innovation and Partnerships here at the National Science Foundation. I've previously served in a number of roles in the Computer Science Directorate, the Computer and Information Science and Engineering Directorate, including as the deputy there for the previous five years. And so it's my pleasure to be with you today uh, and to be able to present a bit about NSF here at the Fall 2021 Virtual Grants Conference. I think like many of my colleagues, we wish we could be with you in person, uh, but we are where we are and we're nonetheless really excited to be able to tell you a little bit about NSF and also to try to answer some of the questions that you may have as well. So what I'm going to do today is walk through a little bit about the science and engineering that NSF supports. Uh, and then I also want to spend some time talking about some new directions for the foundation. As you heard Caitlin describe in her budget overview of NSF, we do have a proposal uh, focused on a new directorate for the foundation on technology and innovation and partnerships. And so I'll spend a little bit of time touching on that proposal as well. So let me first dive in and just revisit for a moment the mission of the National Science Foundation. Uh, as I think you heard from Caitlin, and as I think many of you are aware, NSF has been around since 1950. And as an agency, uh, our mission, according to our uh, statutory NSF Organic Act, is really to promote the progress of science, to advance the national health, prosperity, and welfare, and to secure the national defense. And we do that by supporting investments across a whole slew of science and engineering areas. As a matter of fact, NSF is very unique among uh, federal agencies in the sense that we support nearly every discipline of science and engineering with the exception of medical research, which as I think many of you know, is largely supported by the National Institutes of Health. And so the foundation is structured into a set of directorates and offices, and the directorates correspond to different, different areas of science and engineering, from the biological sciences to engineering, to math and physical sciences and so forth. And we also have a couple of offices like the Office of Integrative Activities, which 
supports the EPSCOR program, uh, as well as the Office of International Science and Engineering, which supports collaborations with uh, partners abroad, among other activities for OIA and OISC uh, that together constitute the makeup of the agency. Now, one of the things that I want to spend some time on today is um, while you've heard about NSF's mission and you've seen the directorates and offices that we have across the agency and the specific technical topic spaces that they cover, you know, our recent, recently arrived director, Dr. Sethiraman Panchanathan, really focuses in on three key pillars for the foundation. One is about advancing science and technology, specifically to address national needs, national and societal challenges that we face, and how can science and engineering be at the forefront of that to help enable solutions to some of those challenges. Second, enabling opportunity everywhere. That is to say, how can we ensure that we are engaging everyone, regardless of background, regardless of organizational affiliation or sector affiliation, and regardless of location, the geographic location in the country, how can we enable an opportunity for anyone and everyone who is interested in potentially contributing to STEM to engage in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics-oriented research and activities? And then third, how do we ensure through our investments that we are maintaining and sustaining the nation's global leadership and competitiveness? And so what I'm going to do over the next few slides is spend a little bit of time talking through some of our investments across these three pillars to give you a flavor for uh, the work that we do at NSF that largely you all do in the community through the investments that we make out of NSF. So let me first start uh, with the future directions of research. Uh, and as part of that, uh, you know, our investments really range from foundational research in new areas, you know, curiosity-driven research to understand how the world works, to much more use-inspired research as well, trying to potentially bring research to the frontiers of key challenges that we face as a society as well. And so this chart and the next few are going to illustrate some examples of that spectrum of research that we support. So in the case of foundational curiosity-driven exploratory research, the image on this particular slide, I think, is really poignant of that. Uh, this is an image that was taken by the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope, DKIST, uh, uh, last year, actually. Uh, publicized pretty broadly, ended up on the front page of the New York Times and a number of other uh, media outlets. This image essentially shows um, the violent motion on the surface of the sun that really transports heat from inside the sun to its surface. And so the bright centers that you see, the bright vesicles, if you will, correspond to heat rising up from the, uh, from the uh, sun to its surface. And the darker boundaries correspond to air cooling off and then sinking below the surface. And the, the motivation here was to really understand uh, the solar atmosphere's outer layer. Uh, it's called the solar uh, corona, to be able to understand how that in turn impacts the earth, how that impacts our atmosphere, how that impacts our lives here on this planet. And so this is an example of the sort of curiosity-driven exploratory research that NSF has long supported and continues to prioritize. Um, and it involves investments in infrastructure like the DKIS telescope, as well as investments in research, sometimes requiring that type of infrastructure to come to fruition. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, if you will, we have um, investments that we make in terms of more use-inspired work. Uh, really some emerging opportunity areas, for example, across the landscape um, of society and how science and engineering can be at the frontiers of that. And so, of course, over the last 18 months, we've all dealt with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I think NSF is really proud of the leadership that we exhibited together with the research community shortly after the emergence of the pandemic last March. Uh, as a matter of fact, NSF put out a call, a dear colleague letter for uh, proposals, uh, rapid response or rapid proposals that allowed us to be able to support a whole range of investments in understanding the virus, understanding its spread, understanding potential diagnostics associated with the virus, even understanding potential interventions from a social, behavioral, economic perspective. How do we get people to potentially change behaviors to be responsive to the virus and prevent its, its broader spread? Uh, within a matter of just a couple of months, NSF invested more than $60 million in those rapid uh, 
projects. And as an example of the impact, uh, NSF co-led the formation of a high-performance computing consortium, bringing together research infrastructure, advanced computing resources, to be able to model and simulate the COVID-19 uh, virus. And as a matter of fact, a team led by the University of California, San Diego, actually uh, developed the first model of the spike protein um, that uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus uses uh, to really be able to um, have the destructive impact that it can have on a, on a human. Uh, and understanding that spike protein, I think, has had subsequent impact in terms of understanding our response, driving vaccine development, and so forth. It was also that discovery was um, the recipient of a Gordon, Gordon Bell Special Prize for COVID-19 research that was awarded last fall. So hopefully that gives you a sense of that spectrum from curiosity driven uh, to more use inspired uh, science and engineering that NSF supports. Um, we fund a number of research centers as well. Uh, so this map illustrates quite a few of those. For example, just in the last year, we've announced engineering research centers that involve universities all across the country. And that range in coverage from understanding biology better to understanding how we can leverage sustainability to improve uh, roadways and transportation mediums. Um, uh, quantum networking is another focus area of an ERC. So really the broad spectrum of science and engineering covered by our research centers as well. Now, I could spend time going around every single one of these circles in this pinwheel and providing you know, examples of the kinds of investments that NSF makes in the work that you all do and others in the community do. But for the sake of time, I won't. Um, but suffice it to say that we really are striving to be able to be at the frontiers of advancing science and technology uh, for societal and national needs as well. I'm gonna shift to the other pillar now. This one has to do with um, uh, trying to understand broadening participation and, and really trying to figure out how we can enhance the participation of everyone everywhere in STEM and STEM education. And as you can see on this map, every single one of the individual icons, if you will, corresponds to about 100,000 people. And you can see who's in the workforce of SME today and just how many more individuals we would need to touch by the year 2030 if we wanted to have the SME workforce really be representative of the US population. So a lot of work to be done undoubtedly to be able to make uh, but to be able to help the SME population better reflect that of the US population. And so one of the investments that we have in this space that we're really focused on is the NSF Includes program, uh, which we started a number of years ago, and among other things is focused on standing up a set of alliances, trying to bring together institutions from across different sectors, so academia, private industry, nonprofits, and others. These uh, multi-institutional alliances really serve as sort of infrastructure for the community to help grow capacity, to be able to help provide programmatics, to be able to help provide resources, if you will, for the community to try to engender and eventually achieve systemic change in terms of how we engage, how we train, and how we ensure folks remain engaged in STEM and STEM education broadly going forward. And as some of you know, in addition to the alliances, we also have vehicles for planning. We also have vehicles for launch pilots to be able to become an alliance down, down the road. Um, this investment NSF includes really aligns with a recommendation that the Committee on Equal Opportunity in Science and Engineering, CIOS, provided to NSF and Congress a number of years ago. So we're really trying to be very respondent but also proactive in terms of our approach with broadening participation. To give you another example, more on the research side of how we really strive to engage uh, the broader uh, continuum of folks across the country, the Civic Innovation Challenge is a program that we launched about a year and a half ago, actually right as the pandemic was, was uh, really rearing its, its, uh, its ugly head. And the goal of the Civic Innovation Challenge has been to try to bring together researchers as well as individuals in local communities across the country to be able to understand some of the foremost challenges in those communities. In the case of the first year of Civic around mobility and transportation, as well as around resilience to natural disasters. And um, what we said was we really wanted the Civic teams to be led by uh, folks in the communities 
partnering with researchers in academia in some sense to really cultivate co-design and co-creation of, of new solutions to some of those foremost challenges in mobility and natural disaster resilience and so forth. And could we then pilot in those same communities potential approaches to, to solving some of those challenges that led to research opportunities and then repeat that process in an iterative way based off of what we learned from those pilots and from those prototyping activities in those communities. We funded 52 projects in the first phase of CIVIC, uh, doing a down selected phase two, even even as we speak. And again, our objective is really to be able to have impact in communities all across the country with science and engineering based solutions uh, to some of our foremost challenges. Uh, so those give you just a sense of a couple of the investments that we make to be able to try to enable opportunity everywhere. And there are a slew of other programs at the graduate level with the Graduate Research Fellowships Program, uh, minority serving institutions, engagement and capacity building. We have specific investments to try to grow capacity at MSIs of different types across the country. Also an investment on advance, uh, which really is focused on um, growing uh, uh, or trying to break through the uh, disparities that we've seen with respect to gender uh, in STEM and STEM education at universities all across the country. The final uh, segment that I want to focus on, uh, the final pillar is global competitiveness. And I'm illustrating that here with a, a chart on artificial intelligence. I think uh, many of you are aware that much of today's AI re revolution really has its roots in investments that NSF and other federal agencies have made going back decades. So for example, our ability to even contemplate self-driving cars has its roots in NSF funded investments in machine learning back in the 1970s. Speech recognition software that we all rely upon on our smartphones uh, and tablets are really built from natural language processing techniques that NSF uh, coined through its investments in the research community, again, back in the 1970s. And you can see other illustrations of that in terms of medical diagnostics, in terms of, in terms of education, uh, and in terms of trying to be able to understand facial expressions in real time as well today. Uh, but we're not resting on our laurels. So I think many of you are familiar with the fact that uh, over the last couple of years, we've focused in on investments in a program called the National Artificial Intelligence Research Institutes Program. The AI Institutes Program really strives to be able to fund large, multidisciplinary, multi-institutional, multi-sector teams that allow us to be able to bring together the diverse perspectives that we need, bring together practitioners, as well as researchers, to be able to tackle the spectrum from foundational to use-inspired AI research. And you can see the set of awards that we made in 2020 and the footprint uh, across the country in the, in the shaded uh, states there. Uh, and uh, the range of topics from foundations of machine learning and trustworthy AI to better understanding how we do student AI teaming or how we think about molecular discovery, molecular uh, synthesis, uh, leveraging AI-based techniques along the way. We just announced uh, a couple months ago the next round of AI Institutes Awards, the 2021 awards. Uh, and you can see how with this set of awards, we've expanded the topical areas. We've also expanded the geography of the country. We have over 40 states plus the District of Columbia actively engaged in the participation of the AI Institutes that we've funded thus far. And I can tell you that we are focused on thinking about the next round of AI Institutes, uh, the next call for proposals, which you'll hear more about in the coming weeks and months as well. So I hope that gives you a sense for how the director and NSF really are prioritizing um, these three pillars of advancing science and technology to address national needs, trying to enable opportunity for everyone everywhere, and also thinking about sustaining the nation's global leadership and competitiveness through investments in those first two pillars as well. I'm going to transition now to taking a little bit of time to dive into this call for a new technology director that I think some of you may have heard of. Um, and I know Caitlin briefly mentioned in her budget overview on NSF as well. Uh, I think Caitlin covered this slide, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. Uh, just noting that the FY22 president's budget request, that is the budget request 
for the fiscal year that has just started, um, is calling for NSF to be at the level of about $10.2 billion, or a 10% increase over um, our, our level in fiscal year 2021. Uh, and we know about investments in a whole range of areas called for in that budget request, but in particular, uh, emphasis on uh, emphases on broadening participation and also on this new technology directory. So let's talk about that technology directory for just a moment. Uh, you all know about uh, different parts of the foundation. I mentioned this at the outset, biology, computer science, education, human resources, and so forth. You can think of them as verticals. I, I don't want to portray them as silos, though. There's a lot of crosstalk and collaboration that has to happen between those directorates as we try to shape opportunities for um, really the frontiers of science at those interdisciplinary boundaries. But we have an opportunity to take that even further and really think of this new directorate as a cross cut, as a horizontal that really tries to elevate the use inspired and translational research that's taking place in um, uh, different parts of the agency as it is today, but really puts a focal point on those investments uh, going forward. Uh, I wanna emphasize that there are three key pieces to this cross cut. One is about cultivating partnerships, building out partnerships with private sector, with nonprofits, with foundations, with state and local governments, with other federal agencies, even with international partners as well in collaboration with our international office. On top of partnerships as sort of a baseline, those partnerships help to fuel new innovations in terms of new technology areas, in terms of cultivating innovation ecosystems that can drive societal solutions to some of our foremost challenges. And then on top of that layer is translation, trying to be able to see how NSF can take the research that we support across the agency, including through this directorate, and really translate it to have impact either in the form of new markets, new products, new small businesses, as we're known for through our SBIR and STTR programs or small business programs, but also translational impacts in terms of educational change at institutions of higher education, taking some of our education research to have that change, translating some of our work to influence policymaking at other federal agencies, really impacting state and local communities based off of the research that we support. So can we think about translational investments broadly, even beyond the SBIR, STTR portfolio that we can also scale and strengthen through this new directory? So let me highlight a few of these uh, pillars, partnerships, technology and innovation, and translation, just very briefly. Uh, as you see on this slide, NSF has a rich history and evidence base of public and private partnerships upon which we are building. We have programs like Rings and Power, where we have a number of direct partnerships with other uh, stakeholders, companies in the private sector, for example. We also have collaborations um, like cs for all or CCIC, the Community College Innovation Challenge, where in many cases, we fund researchers and other activities and projects, and that serves to spawn or catalyze partnerships between the researchers whom we support, the educators whom we support, and other stakeholders in their surrounding communities. And we're fans of both of these types of partnerships, direct relationships between NSF and other stakeholders, and also opportunities for collaboration between NSF funded researchers, as well as folks um, in their communities and their surroundings whom they may be able to enter into relationships with. So goal number one for this directorate is really to be able to help the rest of the agency uh, fuel these types of public and private engagements to a purpose, to be able to help further the frontiers of research, research infrastructure, as well as education. Uh, just as an example of the kinds of partnerships that we see, the Platforms for Advanced Wireless Research or POWER program is something that we started back in 2015, 2016. It's a hundred million dollar public-private partnership that involves today more than 35 companies. They're providing $50 million in funds and in-kind contributions. NSF is matching that with $50 million in funds to essentially stand up four city-scale test beds throughout the country that will allow researchers funded by NSF and funded by the companies to be able to experiment with new wireless technologies, protocols, 
applications and services to help ensure that the US maintains its global competitiveness in terms of 5G and beyond 5G wireless connectivity as well. And you can see the locations of the test beds and you can see some of the topic areas like rural broadband and dampening the cost curve to make rural broadband more accessible uh, to communities and stakeholders across the country. So those are partnerships. The second piece of this new directorate is thinking about technology and innovation. How can we advance the frontiers of science and engineering, new technology areas, and at the same time address societal challenges? And here there are two pieces of pending legislation that you should be aware of. One is the US Innovation and Competition Act, uh, which the Senate has passed. Uh, and among the authorities given to NSF in that is to stand up a program called University Technology Centers that would support multidisciplinary research on key technology areas, insist upon partnerships between academia and other stakeholders, and also strive to enable not just science and innovation, but also pathways for students to be able to get experiential opportunities so that they can be better prepared as the future entrepreneurs and practitioners for our country looking forward. So that's USICA, the US Innovation and Competition Act. And likewise, there's the NSF of the Future Act that the House has passed. And this one specifically calls for the director to stand up a program called Technology Research Institutes. So university tech centers in the Senate, technology research institutes in the House. Here also focusing on advancing fundamental research that will yield new key technologies that will solve societal challenges in education, healthcare, national security areas, that will do so in partnership with a range of stakeholders and sectors, and that will provide students with experiential opportunities in government or industry so that they can be better prepared for jobs on day one. So a lot of synergy between these two bills, um, which actually takes us to the president's FY22 budget request, which in many ways is also very synergistic. And some of you may have seen the budget request, which says that the TIP directorate, Technology Innovation and Partnerships Directorate, will really focus on trying to cultivate regional innovation ecosystems, ecosystems that are throughout the country and that serve to advance both critical technology areas like AI, advanced manufacturing, advanced wireless and biotechnology, but also address societal challenges like climate change or equitable access to healthcare and education or critical and resilient infrastructure. And the bi-directionality that exists between the two with climate change, for example, prompting the need for new AI techniques and new AI techniques in turn, helping us to have a new lens or a new perspective on climate change and how we can mitigate and address climate change going forward as an example. Our goal as we think about regional innovation ecosystems is really to ensure that we are balancing both technical advances as well as geographic innovation. How do we harness the geography of innovation that exists all across the country? And I think a key piece of this directorate is really that emphasis on co-design and co-creation. That is to say, trying to ensure that we bring together, quote unquote, the boots on the ground, the experts in our communities all across the country with researchers, uh, with uh, investors, with others, to be able to sort of change the needle a little bit so that it's not strictly about conducting research and trying to push that out to the market, but rather it's about the market, the society, if you will, demanding some of that research and really trying to extract, to pull out some of the research results for meaningful impact through co-design, iteration, um, prototyping, piloting, and so on. So just to give you a sense of how we think about these regional innovation ecosystems, if you look across the country today, there are some great examples of, of ecosystems that are very vibrant and churning out results all across the country. Pittsburgh, for example, has a vibrant robotics industry that has come together around the universities there. Nashville has a vibrant medical device industry that's come together around the hospital there. Chattanooga, Tennessee is increasingly known for its electric power grid and how the smart grid there has yielded tremendous innovation in terms of applications and services to end users. And Huntsville, Alabama is well known, for instance, for the Air Force Base there and the industry that has congregated around that Air Force 
those ways. So we see point examples all across the country. And I think one of the things that we're thinking about in conjunction with those legislation uh, authorities that uh, I described in conjunction with the president's budget request is how do we take what's worked well in some communities, understand sort of the key characteristics of those, and then try to uh, foster that in communities and states all across the country? And how can NSF investment really serve as an attractor that, that seeks to uh, attract in um, uh, co-investment by private industry, by state and local, by nonprofits, by ventures, and so forth as we look to the future. So this is a piece of how we're thinking about a technology directorate and the impact that it could have in terms of new technology areas, as well as in terms of uh, fostering innovation ecosystems into the future. And then the final uh, layer, if you recall that uh, sort of layer cake from earlier, partnerships, tech, and innovation, the final layer was translation. Uh, and as many of you know, NSF has a vibrant tra uh, technology translation uh, suite of investments today. Uh, we sort of call it the lab to market platform. Uh, there are a number of those reflected on this particular slide. Uh, I'll just highlight a couple, for instance, uh, uh, the NSF i program, which we started back in 2011 to provide entrepreneurial education to folks and help folks with customer discovery on a research result to see if there is a market potential there. SBIR STTR, Small Business Innovation Research, Small Business Technology Transfer Research Programs, which really strive to allow uh, researchers to take their technology, constitute a small business, and take that small business across a various set of steps to see, uh, again, if, if, if that uh, technology and that result uh, can really result in a deep tech uh, that can have market impact into the future. And there are other investments like uh, intern, for example, which provides students with experiential opportunities in private industry as well as in other settings too. And so ultimately, our goal here is to be able to uh, strengthen and scale, as the director of NSF likes to say, uh, NSF's lab to market platform. We have programs that allow PIs to be able to demonstrate their research results, start the process of translating uh, um, those research results to be able to uh, receive the education to understand how they get across the proverbial valley of death, and then to be able to validate their research results to, to understand uh, the market uh, and, and to be able to potentially take it, take their result to market uh, into the future. And so we have this vibrant lab to market platform. And one of the things that we'd like to be able to do through this directorate is really to be able to scale it and strengthen it so that all um, uh, uh, NSF funded research has the opportunity to be able to engage in this sort of translational activity going forward. So I hope that gives you a sense altogether of the foundation of some of the research that we invest in, uh, how we're thinking about those three pillars of advancing the frontiers of science and engineering in, in uh, context of national needs, how we're thinking about trying to engage everyone everywhere, and how we're also thinking about maintaining uh, global competitiveness through our investments. And I also hope that I've given you a sense for the new proposed technology director, director for technology innovation and partnerships, and how we're starting to think about that and ways in which you could potentially engage with that director should it come to pass in the, in the weeks and months uh, to come. Uh, so with that, I'll pause, but um, as, as we like to say at NSF, uh, the time really is now for uh, frontier science and engineering research that can have impact on our knowledge and our understanding of the world, and that can have impact in the nearer term in terms of solutions to some of our foremost challenges. And we look forward to being able to see you all do the work that we support um, and to be able to have that tremendous impact. Thank you for listening, and I'm happy to field any questions. Welcome back. Um, I would like to welcome my colleagues back to uh, come answer a few questions that we've received. Uh, Erwin is joining us uh, here, and uh, I believe we have uh, Tony Di Giovanni, who's the division uh, deputy division director for our for our budget division. There he is, right there. Um, 
now is the time. We do have a few minutes. Uh, we'll go till the top of the hour um, to answer any questions that you have about NSF, about our budget, about technology, innovation, and partnerships. And we do have a few uh, that I've marked that we could that we could answer live that have come in. And the first one, Erwin, um, was a question that came in when you were showing uh, a slide about broadening participation and you know, STEM education programs. Um, and the question is, how can NSF broaden participation? in some of the areas that were shown on the map that are seemingly barren, such as the Mountain West, for example. Yeah, thanks very much, Jeremy. And thanks to those of you for listening to this session for the last 45 minutes or so, uh, and for the questions that you posed, some really great questions in the Q&A box. Uh, and I hope the answers that we've provided have been helpful so far. Uh, in terms of you know, trying to fill out that map, I think that is something that we are constantly and increasingly focused on here at NSF. This is something that our director, uh, Dr. Panchanath, and really emphasized when he joined the agency about a year and a, and a quarter ago now. And it's something that we tried to emphasize in a whole host of our programmatic investments. Part of that is by really trying to help grow capacity uh, at a variety of institution types across the country. We have a range of program programmatic activities uh, that Tony or I could talk about having to do with trying to grow capacity at minority serving institutions, for example, HBCUs, HSIs, tribal colleges and universities. As a matter of fact, just in the last year, we've uh, through our computing directorate and our social behavioral and economic sciences directorate, SBE, really emphasized uh, investments to, and as SBE calls it, build and broaden, if you will, uh, coverage for our MSI uh, uh, institutions across the country. And so I think that that's one angle of this. Another is thinking about the EPSCOR program as well. Uh, so we work very closely between the programmatic offices at the foundation and the EPSCOR program within our Office of Integrated Activities to really try to help uh, in terms of uh, growing capacity in jurisdictions all throughout the country, and also trying to be able to help support individual research projects uh, throughout as well. And one last thing that I'll say is that we really could use your uh, inputs, your advice, your uh, engagement uh, as we think about new strategies in this dimension as well. Uh, the Civic Innovation Challenge that I was talking about when this question was posed is actually one, the idea of that really came from the community in some respects. Uh, and as a result of that idea, I think we have been able to make some headway in terms of the geography of the country by really looking at specific local level challenges that could be addressed through partnerships between researchers and community stakeholders. Uh, but we make, make uh, it's very clear we have a lot more work to do at NSF on this front. Uh, and I think we look to hopefully working with many of you to help facilitate this goal. Thank you uh, for the for detailed response. Um, next couple of questions are, are asking about uh, specific areas of multidisciplinary research that are being considered in both the NSF of, of the Future Act and the U.S. Innovation Competition Act. Tony, do you want me to start? Uh, yes, Vernon, I would like you to, or Erwin, sorry, I would like you to start and finish. Okay, no problem. So with respect to the NSF of the Future Act and the U.S. Um, uh, Innovation Competition Act. So a couple of thoughts on this. Uh, U.S. Innovation Competition Act comes out of the Senate. Uh, NSF of the Future Act comes out of the House uh, of Representatives. Um, as I tried to show on a couple of those slides, there are some uh, uh, relative similarities between the two. There are also some differences, right? And so USICA in particular really emphasizes key technology areas like artificial intelligence, advanced wireless, quantum information science, advanced materials, manufacturing, and so forth. Uh, and there's a list of key technology areas that are specifically called out in that piece of legislation. In terms of the NSF of the Future uh, Act, uh, that is one that focuses more on societal challenges and societal solutions uh, and really tries to think through some of the key challenges that we face as a country that also require multidisciplinary perspectives as well, much as those technology areas. You know, when we talk about AI, for instance, it's not strictly a computer science problem. It's a math, stat, computing, social, behavioral, economic sciences problem and, and beyond. Uh, and so those are slightly different perspectives that those two pieces of legislation take, one really focused on key technologies and one really focused on societal challenges and solutions therein. Um, 
And so I hope that helps in terms of those two areas. And I would encourage folks to take a few minutes to just scan these pieces of legislation. I know legislation can be boring sometimes, um, but they're really interesting in terms of their coverage of NSF. Okay, and there's a question somebody asking uh, about the heat map for regional innovation ecosystems. I'm uh, Erwin, I think you may might have wanted to say a little bit more about that than just provide a link to the yeah, so I, I just, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I'd say that that heat map that you saw was really meant to be illustrative. Please don't uh, read too much into the specific dots where they're located on that map. Uh, but I think that the four examples are just, again, also meant to be illustrative. Now, I, I think I highlighted on that chart, Pittsburgh and Chattanooga and Nashville. Uh, among others. And so those are really meant to be illustrative, uh, but we can certainly uh, try to make those slides available to folks after after this session. Yes, and we will have the slides posted um, on the on the uh, conference website, so you'll be able to, to see them there. Um, Erwin, you're talking about uh, broadening participation, and the question here is a, quite a broad one in general, um, but if the question is, if we are an interested minority serving institution, where or whom should we contact at NSF? Yeah, great question. So a couple of couple of uh, comments that I would make. First, I would strongly encourage folks to take a look at the uh, NSF uh, website. And in particular, we have dedicated programs um, that, that we, could, we could spend a little bit more time on uh, that speak to uh, historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, tribal colleges and universities, and so on. And so at the at the very least, I would encourage you, uh, and we can probably get you links to those, uh, to take a look at those programs and get in touch with the Cognizant Program Officers for those programmatic areas. I mentioned a few minutes ago in the field of computing and information science, there's a size MSI research expansion program. Again, looking at our webpage for that program and getting in touch with the Cognizant Program Officer there would make sense. And similarly, build and broaden in the social behavioral and economic sciences as well. Um, again, we have programs that span the agency as a whole, and we also have programs that are specific to individual scientific and engineering disciplines that NSF supports. Great, thank you. There are a number of questions that we get are, are very specific, um, and one of, the, the, one of the, the, the good things to know is uh, one of the phrases we use quite often is ask early, ask often, and we do uh, when you do have specific questions, as Erwin said, you should really contact the, the cognizant, you know, the program officer that's most closely aligned with the with the work that you're looking to do. Um, all of the uh, contact information for NSF staff is available online. You can get our direct phone numbers uh, as well as our email addresses, and so you can find us there. And so I really would um, uh, recommend that you do that if you have specific questions about your research. Um, if you have specific questions about a funded project that you already have, you want to start, you either want to talk to the your Cognizant Program Officer, or you may need to talk to the Grants Officer on that award. So that's something um, that you'll see in your award letter. You'll have the, the information for the uh, Program Officers uh, and also for the Grants Officer as well. Um, one uh, Another question that we have is, what is the best way for young professionals to get involved with NSF? And I'm, I'm assuming you're asking from a, from, a, from a researcher perspective. And I think, you know, Erwin, you would probably agree that one of the best things to do is get involved in becoming a reviewer uh, for NSF projects. Um, it's a great way to uh, get in the door to understand how the process works. It can help you also in turn uh, with your own proposal writing as well, because you're going to see how other people are looking at your at your projects. I don't know, uh, Erwin, if you had any other uh, comments to add to that. Yeah, sure, I'll add to that. I could not agree with you more, Jeremy, definitely getting involved as a reviewer. And you might wonder, well, what's the best way to be able to do that? And I think the answer to that is really, again, um, you know, if, if you're an early career researcher, for instance, and uh, you're focused in a particular area in biology or you're focused in a particular area in the geosciences and so on, I would encourage you to look at look for the program or programs that are most closely aligned with your research area. You can find funding opportunities on our NSF um, uh, website. Uh, I think under the funding tab, I'd encourage you to try to find that funding opportunity that aligns with your area. And then uh, again, check out that program page, 
and uh, find the Cognizant Program Officer and get in touch with them. I will tell you, to Jeremy's point, our program officers, you know, a key function of what we do is run a merit review process uh, to be able to find to be able to determine which projects we can which projects we should fund. Uh, and as part of that effort, uh, our PDs are constantly looking for uh, reviewers who folks who have the time to come in and serve as reviewers. So reaching out to a program officer offering your your name up as a potential reviewer for a forthcoming panel or review uh, activity, uh, our program officers are almost always delighted to hear from you and will follow up with you. Thank you. We do have a question uh, asking us whether NSF considers proposals from outside the US. Uh, NSF primarily funds uh, US institutions. Uh, you do not have to be a US citizen for most programs at NSF. There are uh, funding opportunities that require you to be uh, either a U.S. citizen or permanent resident, depending on the program, but uh, the, you, you um, may also, uh, NSF funding can also be, uh, there, there is an international, there are international components to NSF programs. Those are typically done through subawards from the U.S. institution to a foreign organization. Um, I'm, uh, one of the questions is how, how can we become a reviewer? Should we contact our cognizant program officer to become a reviewer? Yes, um, we do. NSF does not have a central kind of uh, uh, system for submitting your, you know, identifying your willingness to become a reviewer. You want to contact the, the program officer, perhaps send them um, a, a brief CV uh, and let them know your qualifications and that you're available to be a reviewer. Um, there are a number of questions coming in that are very specific to certain programs. Again, I would encourage you to contact the Cognizant Program Officer uh, for those programs should you have questions. And again, a lot of these questions may be uh, also proposed in other sessions this week, the proposal preparation session, which is this afternoon. Um, in just a half hour, it will begin. So if you didn't get your question answered today, you could, uh, in this session, you could try that session. Uh, there's also sessions tomorrow on merit review and award management. So I'd encourage you uh, to attend those. Um, we are just about out of time. I want to thank uh, Erwin and Tony for joining us today and hope that you'll be able to join us this afternoon for proposal preparation and for the other sessions that are happening the rest of the week. Thank you all very much for joining. Take care.